Hello, everyone. My name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs in the Paranormal. This is actually part two of a two-part episode I call the Top 20 UFO Cases in Arizona. In part one, I presented case number 20 all the way to 11. And here in part two, I'm going to present the top 10 cases. And as I said in part one, these are the most influential cases, cases that have received a lot of publicity, cases that have unique and interesting elements, basically the best cases, the cases that have had a really profound influence on how we perceive and understand the UFO phenomenon. I'm going to do a countdown from case number 10 all the way to number one. And again, another researcher would probably have come up with a different list. Uh, it was very hard to choose between so many encounters, but these are the ones I came up with. And I think you'll find them quite interesting. I certainly hope so. So let's get started. For case number 10, I chose the UFO abduction of Brian Allen Scott. This is not a very well-known case, although there is a full-length book on this case. And it's quite unusual with some very interesting elements, some good evidence, and I think you'll find it very interesting. Brian Allen Scott was born on October 12, 1943 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And as he grew up, he started to have a number of unusual experiences. At age 16, for example, he was walking outside his home when a small orange ball of light dropped from the sky and hovered right next to him and darted right back up. And this happened several times. But his major alien experiences didn't really begin until he moved to Arizona. He was 28 years old, March 14, 1971. And he had gone out with his friend, Nick Corbin, to the Apache Junction area in the wilderness of the Superstition Mountains to go target shooting. And suddenly a UFO showed up, a glowing oval-shaped object hovered overhead. And the next thing Brian knows, he is being pulled up into this craft. A doorway opened. He's pulled inside and set down inside a corridor. He said the inside of this object was warm, musty, and brightly lit with a strange foggy light. Next thing he knows, his friend Nick is being pulled through the same doorway and deposited right beside him. Both men felt numb, unable to speak, when two seven-and-a-half-foot-tall gray-skinned figures came through another doorway and began to undress them. Nick became frightened, tried to resist, and he passed out and was taken out of Brian's view. Brian says he felt little fear, but he was unable to resist as this figure led him to another room where there was yet another figure, and this second figure was manipulating a strange alien instrument which emitted a beam of light, striking Brian's body. He felt numb, and it says it gave him a headache. And at this point, an even taller being entered the room and placed its hand on Brian's head and proceeded to communicate. And this being said his name was Voltar, and began showing Brian images of its home planet, which he said had been destroyed by a mutated virus. At this point, Brian and his friend Nick were then put back into the corridor where they had first arrived, and then floated gently down to the ground. The UFO darted away, and they returned to their car. It was now past 11 p.m., so this experience had taken at least two hours. And at this point, Brian could still remember everything that happened. But as they drove away, his memory instantly faded. And by the time he got home, the only thing he'd, he could recall was seeing this strange craft. And everything else was shrouded in missing time. Two years later, on March 22, 1973, he returned to the site of this UFO event. And he saw a small humanoid entity. It freaked him out and he fled the scene. And following this, he had a series of missing time abductions. One on October 25, 1973. Another two years later on November 21st, 1975. And December 22nd, 1975. And on that last one, he was missing for over a day, for 27 hours. 
So he realized what was happening at this point, and he sought out a UFO investigator. His case generated quite a bit of interest, and researchers from APRO, QFOS, and MUFON converged and began to investigate. Brian eventually went under regressive hypnosis and was able to recall what had happened during his first abduction. And this is when things got really weird. He began to fall into trances during which he would make strange drawings or channel alleged alien entities. At the same time, numerous small balls of light were often seen around him. And this was verified by his ex-wife and several investigators. In fact, there were so many experiences like this that his ex-wife uh, had to be hospitalized because of panic and hysteria. This happened on several occasions. Brian also began to exhibit the ability of spoon bending, bending metal. This usually happened when he lapsed into a trance. And there were all kinds of other strange phenomena. Mysterious drops of water would materialize over his head. Once he materialized an ancient Greek gold coin, whose authenticity was later confirmed by numismatists. Researcher Bill Hamilton personally interviewed Brian and saw him perform spoon bending. He sat in on Brian's channeling sessions. Brian's voice was recorded during some of these channeling sessions, and electronic analysis showed that it was different from Brian's normal voice. The information given during these sessions typically involved very deep subjects, such as binary and trinary computer mathematics, genetics and cloning, orbital mechanics, astronomy, electromagnetics, quantum physics, and more. So all kinds of weird stuff happened to Brian. He began uh, having precognition, actually gave some prophecies that turned out to be accurate. Uh, it's quite a long story, too complex to really tell in its totality here. There is a full-length book on his case written by James Frazier. It's called Transformation of a Common Man, the Brian Scott Story. It's really an incredible story of UFO abduction with all sorts of really good evidence and strange elements to it. And that's why I gave it the number 10 spot on this list. Now we move to case number nine. And for number nine, I chose UFO sighting at Davis Mountain Air Force Base. This occurred on May 1st, 1952. It's a very interesting multiple witness sighting that caused quite a shakeup at high levels within our Air Force. And that's why I gave it space number nine on this list. Jayon Hynek says of this case, and I quote, this case is a classic. And in fact, it really shook up the Air Force at high levels. This was again on May 1st, 1952. And on that day, Air Force Intelligence Officer Major Rudolf Pestalozzi was standing at the steps of the base hospital at Davis Monthan Air Force Base when he and another airman saw two round metallic objects approach a B-36 plane, which was flying directly over the base. The two objects raced forward at about four times the speed of the B-36, then slowed down and took formation around it. One object flew about 20 feet behind the port side, while the other flew between the right engine and the leading edge of the tail, so right next to this B-36. And for the next five minutes, these two objects paced the aircraft, then suddenly took off. One took off first, and then the other disc stopped, hovered, and followed the other. Thoroughly shaken up, the crew of the B-36 requested permission to make an immediate landing at Davis Mountain. Permission was, of course, granted, and Major Pestalozzi, as the intelligence officer, interrogated the crew of the B-54 and learned that all 10 men aboard had closely observed both objects, which they said had a convex top and bottom, were about 25 feet in diameter and about 12 feet thick. The plane suffered no malfunctions, but Major Pestalozzi was impressed by this sighting, which he himself witnessed, 
and he prepared a file about the incident, which he called, quote, the thickest report I'd ever filed on a UFO. So the Air Force was, of course, notified, and J. Allen Hynek was called in to investigate the case, and he labeled it unidentified. Unfortunately, Blue Book officials did not agree. And as J. Allen Hynek writes, and I quote, Despite the detailed description of the maneuvers of two shiny silver objects, Blue Book dis dismissed this case as aircraft. Years later, in 1966, Dr. James McDonald heard about this case and decided to investigate. He contacted Project Blue Book, and he learned that the files were actually missing. <laughs> they could not find them, they said. So, unable to get any cooperation from Blue Book officers, Dr. McDonald contacted the witnesses himself. He did a big investigation and then sent Blue Book a letter. He sent it to Major Hector Quintanilla, the head of Project Blue Book, detailing the details of his investigation and everything he had learned. And as Heineck writes, and I quote, I recall that at that time, Dr. McDonald was regarded by Blue Book personnel as an outstanding nuisance. This was partly because he was interested in a scientific study of the true UFOs and partly because he was so outspoken. He spoke his mind forcefully and didn't hesitate to criticize Blue Book methods whenever possible. It is due to the industry and perseverance of Dr. James MacDonald that this excellent case was resurrected at all. Here's a very interesting endnote about this case. Major Rudolf Pestalozzi was apparently a UFO contactee, and he later, following this case, said that he was actually in telepathic contact with ETs and receiving messages from them. And in fact, he published a book of his channeled messages, which he called Letters to You from Balaran. So as you can see, that's a very interesting case, and that's why I gave it number nine on this list. So that's number nine. Now we move to number eight. And for number eight, I chose Walt Andrus Sees a UFO. This is a very interesting multiple witness daylight sighting involving a trained observer, and it ended up having a really, really profound an impact on the UFO field which is why I gave it this number eight slot on this list, and I believe you'll find it really interesting. On August 15, 1948, Walt Andrus, who was a graduate of the U.S. Navy Electronics Technician Program, a pilot and amateur radio operator, was with his wife and son in downtown Phoenix, when they all saw four daylight disks flying in formation overhead. Walt Andrus first noticed the disks after his five-year-old son shouted out, Daddy, look, silver balloons. He looked up and couldn't believe his eyes. As he says, Four round, dull silver objects were floating slowly in the northwest at an angle of 45 degrees above the horizon, moving straight west. Three were flying in geometric formation, while the fourth was lower and considerably behind the first. Everyone on our side of the street stopped to watch these objects as we followed them across the sky. Moving directly west, the objects arrived at a point nearly straight north of us when the lead object disappeared in the clear sky. Shortly after that, the rest of the objects followed, disappearing in the same spot, Walt Andrus was also a weather observer. He would re release weather balloons on a near daily basis, and he's absolutely positive that these objects were not balloons. So they continued to watch the sky, and to their surprise, three of these objects reappeared in the distance, still flying in formation. They were visible for only a few seconds before darting away, but it was long enough for Walt Andrus to see that these were circular, thin, disc-like objects. As he says, and I quote, you remember it vividly. 
it makes an impression on your mind that you never wipe out. So he was stunned. This led to a lifelong interest in UFOs and inspired him to join APRO. And then 20 years later, in 1967, he became one of the founding members of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and in fact headed the organization for many years and was editor of the MUFON Journal. So you can see how important this case was and what an impact it had on the UFO field. We, mal we now move to number seven. And for case number seven, I chose the UFO research of Dr. James McDonald. Dr. James McDonald was an atmospheric physicist at the University of Arizona and one of the first scientists to really dig into UFO research. He had a profound impact on the field and that's why I gave him the number seven slot on this list. The impact of Dr. James McDonald cannot be underestimated in my opinion. Uh, he was born on May 7, 1920 and first became interested in UFOs following a sighting. But let me first just give a quote from Dr. James McDonald, which I think is a really interesting quote. As Dr. James McDonald says, the type of UFO reports that are most intriguing are close range sightings of machine like objects of unconventional nature and unconventional performance characteristics seen at low altitudes and sometimes even on the ground. The general public is unaware of the large number of such reports from credible witnesses. When one starts searching for such cases, their numbers are quite astonishing. So as I said, Dr. James McDonald first became interested in UFOs following a sighting. He was 34 years old, it was 1954, and he was driving through the Arizona desert with two other meteorologists when he spotted an an unidentified flying object. They all looked up. None of them men could identify this object. It was just a distant point of light in the sky, but it was absolutely unexplainable to them. And this is what brought Dr. James McDonald into the field of ufology. And by the late 1950s, he began quietly investigating UFO reports uh, not only in Arizona, but across the United States. He joined various UFO groups, and uh, given his training in atmospheric physics, he was able to bring his scientific knowledge to study these, these reports and explain some of them that had been inexplicable. Dr. McDonald also had a security clearance with the USO, U.S. government, and so he was able to look at a number of UFO reports from Project Blue Book and was surprised to find how many of them were absolutely unexplained. And he ended up investigating hundreds of cases. And I'd like to just quote one really interesting case of a UFO landing that he was never able to explain. This occurred on the evening of October 9, 1967, when a 13-year-old boy by the name of Richard, who was the son of a prominent businessman in the area, he was riding his bike around the neighborhood when he came upon an eight-foot-tall metallic cylindrical-shaped object resting on the ground about 50 feet away. This object stood on two legs, each of which ended on a large circular pad, and wondering what this thing was, Richard moved closer and got to about 35 feet distance when suddenly this object made a deep, low-pitched hum and took off straight upwards, disappearing into the night sky. So Richard approached the area where this object had landed and saw deep imprints in the soil. Uh, Dr. James McDonald heard about the case and was able to investigate. He photographed and examined the landing traces and determined that these two landing pads were 42 inches apart and 13.4 inches wide and were made in hard packed soil. So whatever this object was, it was quite heavy. 
He was very much impressed by this case, so he contacted Air Force officials at Davis Monthan Air Force Base and told them about this incident. Blue Book Air Force personnel came in and conducted an investigation. And later, Air Force Colonel Raymond Sleeper wrote a 60-page report on the case, finally labeling it a hoax. This shocked Dr. McDonald, who absolutely disagreed and believed that the boy had seen a genuine UFO. Jim and Cora Lorenzen also investigated the case and agreed with Dr. James McDonald. So this just goes to show how Project Blue Book was not a true investigative body. And Dr. James McDonald became very vocal in this field at this point. He criticized Project Blue Book and he also criticized Dr. J. Allen Hynek for not being more assertive and vocal about UFO cases. He was highly critical of the U.S. government's handling of this subject and critical of other mainstream scientists' refusal to take this subject seriously. And so many cases would have gone unrecorded if not for James McDonald. He really brought a lot of science and credibility to this subject that was sorely lacking. He was really the only or one of very few mainstream scientists who was openly investigating UFO reports at this time. And in fact, his impact was so influential that researcher Anne Druffel wrote a book about James McDonald's investigations and his life. The book is called Firestorm. And it shows what a crucial and integral role James McDonald played in the UFO field. Unfortunately, he died on June 13, 1971. But again, Dr. James McDonald's impact on this field is absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. And that's why I gave him spot number seven on this list. So that's number seven. And as you can see, he did have a really big impact on this field. Probably even more influential is what I chose for number six, which is the UFO research of Jim and Coral Lorenzen. They were the founders of APRO, the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, which was the first citizen UFO group. It's quite a story. It definitely deserves a spot on this list, which is why I gave it number six. Jim Lorenzen was born in 1922, and Cora Lorenzen was born three years later in 1925. And Cora Lorenzen saw her first UFO at age nine in Wisconsin. It was quite a famous, well-publicized event, and this is what sparked her interest in UFOs. But it wasn't until years later, in fact, on June 10, 1947, when Cora Lorenzen had another major UFO sight sighting. It was 11 p.m. She stepped out on her porch when she saw a glow forming to the south. It increased in brightness and became a ball of light which zipped upwards at high speed until disappearing. And she had seen balloons and missile launches and had never seen anything like this. And she says, and I quote, there was only one explanation for the thing I had seen. There might be intelligent life on other worlds, and their ships were the strange things people had reported in the heavens from time to time through the years. So this sighting really intrigued her, and this was the event that inspired her to form the group APRO, the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization. And this is the first citizen UFO study group the first group of its kind of any influence, and they formed it in 1952, and it quickly became very popular. They had thousands of members. They had investigators from all across the U.S. and the world. They started issuing a monthly newsletter and just had an enormous impact on this field. They really were the ones who popularized the subject of UFOs. They put out a series of very well-received books. And in fact, they were the first to recognize the phenomena of missing time. They were among the first to recognize humanoid reports. So they were true pioneers in this field. 
And it turns out our own government was very, very interested in what was going on with APRO. And just one year after APRO had been formed, the Lorenzans discovered that they were being spied on by the U.S. government. One summer day in 1953, Coral was at her home when two men drove up, stopped, and knocked on the door, claiming to be paint contractors and wanting to paint the house. Coral informed these two men that they were actually renters, and the painters then tried to engage Coral in casual conversation and get her to talk about APRO, which she thought was strange. They then returned to their car and drove off, and she noticed they didn't stop at anyone else's house, which she, she thought was strange. If they were truly painters, why did they not stop at other people's homes? So she told her husband, Jim, and later they shared the story with other people in APRO and made a shocking discovery. As it turned out, the treasurer of APRO and the secretary of APRO both reported that they were visited by apparently the same two mysterious gentlemen. And in both cases, these gentlemen seemed more interested in talking about APRO than about obtaining a contract to do painting. So that was weird. And uh, after that, they found out that one of their UFO field investigators was actually a CIA agent. So this really shook them up, and uh, they started looking into this. And Jim Lorenzen actually discovered that the government was, in fact, very interested in their research. As Jim Lorenzen writes, an associate of Miss Lorenzen whose husband worked in the OSI, the Office of Special Investigations, told her that the local office had a sizable dossier on APRO and the Lorenzans. The government, while claiming that UFOs weren't real, was actually very interested in what APRO was doing. APRO remained very active in this field for more than 35 years, Though around 1969, the membership of APRO began to decline because there was a new group, uh, the Mutual UFO Network. Uh, but they absolutely changed the face of UFO research. They provided the model, really, for all other UFO groups, and APRO remained active until their death. Jim Lorenzen died in 1986, and Coral died two years later. But their influence on this field was absolutely uh, phenomenal. And now we get to the top five. This was not an easy choice, but for number five, I chose the UFO encounters over Arizona mines. There are more than a dozen of these types of cases in which UFOs hover over various mines. Arizona has more of these types of encounters than any other state I could find. It's had a very profound influence on the field, provides some very interesting insights, I think, into the ET agenda. And that's why I gave it slot number five on this list. Arizona, as it turns out, is the leading producer of copper in the United States. And there are more than a dozen cases of UFOs hovering over mines. This is more than any other state. It's clear that this is an agenda. These cases are really uniquely Arizonan. And uh, so many cases involving not only sightings, but landings and humanoids. So this is a really interesting aspect of Arizona UFO encounters. So let's just get into some of these amazing cases. Uh, one occurred on March 6, 1980 in Warren, Arizona, when witnesses saw a disc hovering over the mine tailings in this mine at Warren, Arizona. This disc turned on its edge, flew to the south, and was gone. The entire sighting lasted eight minutes, and it was clear to the witnesses that this object was interested in the mines. Another very interesting case occurred at the Green Valley Copper Mine. This was on August 20th, 1988. A married couple were driving near their home, which is right by the mine. This is an abandoned mine. And they saw this 
glowing red and yellow cylinder hovering above the mine tailings. And the moment they saw it, this object began to move back and forth, getting closer and then farther away, appearing and disappearing, when suddenly it zoomed towards them and was only 50 feet away. So they got a very good view of it and could see that it was thin and tall, like a tower, they said, and was glowing with a neon-type light. Both witnesses felt it was almost alive. It impressed them so much that they reported it to MUFON. So many cases. Here's one that occurred on December 28, 2001, at a gold mine near Tucson. There's a gentleman whose name is Barry, and I'll just quote Barry directly. As Barry says, I am a regular guy. I am a four-year veteran of the Army. I have an associate's degree in structural engineering and an advanced degree in heavy equipment operation. So he was working at this uh, site next to this gold mine in Tucson, working on the night shift using a track hoe to feed an incinerator. Uh, he had a co-worker with him who was a retired Special Forces major. And as they're working, suddenly this immense craft, which they described as about a mile long, covered with weird lights, appeared over this gold mine nearby. And uh, this really impressed Barry. And as Barry says, and I quote, My esteemed colleague got a deathly white sheen to his face and would not come out of his personal jeep. He was scared, and he was babbling like a child. Me, I turned the track hoe to face it, the UFO, and kept flicking my daylighters in the hope that they could come and see who was behind those lights. I felt at ease, no panic. You see, I felt as though these were my friends, like we had met before. This object began to disappear and reappear, but as Barry says, it was, quote, Never too far from this gold mine it was hovering over. Finally, it moved off and was gone. The very next night, two military attack Cobra helicopters hovered over the site. And when they remained for over an hour, Barry turned on the floodlights. At that point, the helicopters circled the site and headed directly towards that gold mine, Barry says. And uh, apparently they were interested in this sighting that had occurred the day before. Two weeks later, Barry's co-worker, the Special Forces Major, quit and made it very clear to Barry that he never wanted to talk about what happened. Barry was very impressed and reported this sighting to New Fork just a short time later. And here's another case. June 14, 1953. This occurred at the Open Pit Copper Mine in Silver Bell, Arizona. Around sundown, a group of rodeo cowboys observed a huge globe-shaped object hovering over this open pit mine. They first thought it was a balloon, but decided that no, it wasn't because it was hovering in place was aluminum in appearance and quite large, about 100 feet wide. Finally, it began to move. It moved over copper buttes and hovered there, then streaked away very quickly, turning a deep blue-green. Then it slowed down and stopped over nearby Elroy and at this point resumed its metallic appearance. Some of the witnesses got out their binoculars and observed it and suddenly this object winked out. But again, all of them were impressed that this object was very interested in the open pit copper mine at Silver Bell. Another case occurred at Page, Arizona at the Zantelli Western Mining Company. This occurred on the evening of June 3rd, 1964, and one of the witnesses was the foreman of the mine, a gentleman by the name of Edward Coyle, who said he saw a reddish glowing egg-shaped object about 500 to 1,000 feet over the mine. He watched it for just a few moments when it started to move off to the northwest. He notified the owners of the mine, Pat and June Patterson, and it turned out later that night there was another witness, Frank Howard, the night watchman of the mine, saw the same or another similar object 
moving off to the south of the mine. So there's another case of these UFOs <laughs> investigating these mines. And here's another interesting series of events in which UFOs visited the same area on at least three separate occasions over a period of decades. This is near the mines in Pima, Arizona. The first case occurred just after midnight on July 22nd, 1971, when an anonymous witness saw a flat disc with a teardrop-shaped tail and a bluish glowing light around its exterior. He estimated it was moving at about 45 miles per hour over the waste dumps of the mine in Pima. This is 30 miles south of Tucson. As he watched, this cr craft rocked back and forth, was clearly under intelligent control. He watched it dart at right angles and finally zip away. And he admits he actually saw this UFO on another occasion a few days earlier. And he was absolutely convinced it was coming to investigate this mine. Another case occurred about nine years later in November of 1980. The witness was George Parks, who worked the night shift at the BHP Copper Mines in San Manuel. And driving home from work one evening, he had an amazing, very close-up UFO sighting. And I'll just quote George directly, as he says, Coming around the bend at Oracle Junction, I saw a metallic craft hovering not far from the road, and I saw seven windows. Behind every window stood a figure, and an instant later it flew off. So it turns out George Parks was in the military for more than 20 years, and he says he never saw anything like that in all his time in the military. This sighting inspired him to join MUFON, and he became a field investigator, and before long he became the Pima County Section Director for MUFON, and later the MUFON Arizona State Director. So this really changed his life. And as he says, and I quote, I'm still looking for answers. And it was some 37 years later when there was yet another sighting over this same area. This next sighting occurred on August 29, 2017. And it's a very interesting sighting because the witness was in a jet flying from San Diego, California to Atlanta, Georgia, and was flying over Arizona at about 35,000 feet. And he's looking down through the window, and he could see the open pit copper mine in Pima, Arizona. And as he says, and I quote, I noticed a disc at low altitude near the mine. It was a saucer-shaped disc. It stood out in the terrain, just hovering. So many cases, I'm telling you, the UFOs are absolutely interested in these mines. There are two cases which occurred at the Lavender Pit copper mine. The first one occurred quite some time ago on June 27, 1947. This is just about one week before the very famous Roswell UFO crash. The main witness is John Petch. He's an electrician employed at the Phelps Dodge Copper Mine in Bisbee, Arizona. He and two other workers said they saw a silver, mirror-like disc. And it was silent, wobbling, and just moved slowly overhead. And meanwhile, a mile and a half away, three other mine employees, including John Rylance, Mr. L. W. Maxwell, and Milton Luna saw in this same object moving lower and lower until it actually landed on this little hill at the mine. The gang boss for the mine crew, his name is Vernon C. McMinn, said that other people at the mine had also observed the object and described the same thing these other witnesses had seen. And there were more witnesses to this event. There was a gentleman by the name of Major George B. Wilcox. He was a U.S. Army officer, 
and he says he observed eight or nine light-colored disc-shaped craft moving at low elevation over the Bisbee area at the same time of this mine sighting. He said the objects were evenly spaced in single file and moved with a dipping, rocking motion. And it was many years later, in the 1980s, when this same mine was visited again. The anonymous witness was a former rocket scientist who worked as a telemetry collector and analyst for the NSA. And at this time, he was at a gas station next to the Lavender Pit Copper Mine in Bisbee when this metallic oblate spheroid object about 100 feet in diameter hovered 250 feet overhead. He said it was silent except for a low humming noise. He turned to the gas station owner and said, do you see that? And the gas station owner replied, I sure do. He said it was so low he had the impulse to throw a rock at it, but decided that probably wasn't a good idea. Both witnesses felt they were being observed by the UFO occupants, and they weren't the only witnesses. Cars were driving by. They would slow down, look at it, and then speed off. As the witness says, nobody stopped, although they could be seen leaning down and forward briefly to get a better look. So they watched this for several moments, at which point the object moved directly over the mine itself, then accelerated the, to the west toward the Queen Mine at Bisbee. At this point, jet fighters appeared, obviously chasing this object. They were only a few hundred feet high. And as the witness says, our government knows about these things. Who's kidding who here? Probably the most amazing series of events like this occurred at the Marenzi Copper Smelting Plants. One amazing case occurred on October 23, 1980, when five men at the Marenzi plant observed a large, dull black boomerang-shaped object approaching the smokestacks of the Marenzi copper smelting plant. This object hovered over the smokestacks and actually began sending down a brilliant beam of light into each smokestack. And then one of them dropped a small fireball or a probe into one of the smokestacks. One of the men, his name was Joe Navarez, made a mental wish asking for this object to return so he could get a better look at it and it did it pulled a quick u-turn and hovered much closer so they all got a better look at it and off it moved off into the distance so this incident got a lot of publicity it was investigated by the international center for ufo research a small ufo group located in scottsdale and they said that throughout the 1980s a huge boomerang shaped object described as nearly a half mile wide, would appear repeatedly over Marinci. Marinci is a little mining town. And on a few occasions, this object was witnessed by literally hundreds of people. For example, more than 100 students at the Marinci High School observed this object and described it as being several football fields in size. And there's another case involving a humanoid at the Marinci copper mine. This occurred on August 11th, 2017, not too long ago. And I will just quote a friend of the witness. As this anonymous gentleman says, and I quote, At work in a copper mine in Morenci, Arizona, a friend of mine saw this bright light through the window. He went outside and took a picture. A few days later, while showing the picture to a friend, it was enlarged, and you could make out a small human-like figure on the left side of the glowing object. The fence in the picture is about six feet high. And according to the witness, uh, behind this fence, there is a slope which drops down to around 100 feet. So it's a difficult area to uh traverse. So apparently they did not notice this humanoid figure, and uh, you can make of it what you will. 
Uh, but it's definitely a very interesting report and yet another encounter over these copper mines in Arizona. And now we move to number four. For number four, I chose the UFO hotspot of Sedona. There are many hotspots all across the United States, and Sedona is definitely one of the most active areas in the United States, if not on this entire planet. The number of encounters coming out of here is phenomenal. So that's why I gave it the number four slot on this list. I'm not going to be able to tell you all the encounters that have happened there. There's far too many. But I would like to give you a little bit of a rundown of some of the more interesting sightings, landings, uh, some abduction cases, some photographic cases. I mean, it's just incredible what's going on at Sedona. So that's why I gave it the number four spot on this list. Sedona is very easily the most active area in all of Arizona. And there have been literally hundreds of cases of not only sightings, but landings, face-to-face uh, -face encounters, abductions. I mean, you name it, it's happened in Sedona. It would be impossible to cover all the cases that have gone on there. So I would like to cover just a small selection of some of the sightings, landings, and abductions that have taken place there. And lots of photographs, too. Uh, in 1986, there was a huge wave of sightings, uh, and some of these were really interesting accounts. For example, on May 11, 1986, a minister and private pilot by the name of Robert Henderson was flying with his wife in a Cessna, and uh, they were over Verde Valley in Sedona when they saw a bright flash of light ahead of them, and it quickly approached their plane on what he thought was a collision course, and he was just getting prepared to take evasive action when this object, which he said was a half sphere with the flat side down, passed at very high speeds to the left of his plane and darted off. Another very interesting case that occurred during this wave involved a woman who lived in Sedona, and she was preparing dinner one evening when suddenly there was a huge bright light which illuminated the interior of her house and all the area outside of it. She ran outside and saw this huge disc-shaped object, larger than her house, moving only a few hundred feet overhead. It moved slowly up a nearby canyon and then disappeared. Another really interesting case involves a gentleman by the name of Stan, who said during and throughout 1986, he saw this red and white object hovering over his home in the Loy Butte area. And usually it was some distance off, but one evening it flew directly toward him and stopped very low overhead. And looking up, he could see that the red part of the UFO was actually a spherical light attached underneath it. And at this point, the red light detached, swooped down, and circled several times over his home as though probing it. And then this light darted back upwards, attached to the larger white object, and both promptly flew off and away to the west. Again, in 1986, a father and son were hiking on Airport Mesa in Sedona, when they saw a large silver-shaped object hovering between the thunderclouds overhead. They watched it for 10 minutes, it was perfectly stationary, and then became lost in the clouds. So many cases. Another really interesting case occurred to a Cottonwood resident who was driving over the Mingus Mountains in Sedona when she saw a group of glowing orange spheres of light moving in procession. And then seconds later, she saw three military helicopters chasing these objects. It was a short sighting, but once again betrays our government's interest in these UFOs. Another case during this 1986 wave occurred on December 19, when a family in Sedona was driving near Doe Mountain, and they saw what they first thought was a helicopter, but it turned out it wasn't. It was a brilliant sphere of light emitting a rainbow array of prismatic colors. And as they watched this thing 
rocketed straight upwards until it was a tiny point of light way high up there and disappeared into the clouds. Another 1986 case involved a couple and a friend who were driving at night near the Mongolian Rim when their headlights failed. And at that moment, they saw a glowing triangular-shaped UFO hovering 500 feet above their car, and it remained in place for five minutes before moving to the west. Now here's a very interesting case, which was investigated by Tom Dongo. Uh, he is a Arizona resident and has actually written a series of books about UFO encounters in the Sedona area. And this witness was a major, he was a major for U.S. Airlines. And in 1986, he was driving on Highway 89A from Sedona to Prescott. And as he passed the Mingus Mountains, he saw strange flashes of light. And as Tom Dongo writes, he left his car to investigate the area. And in the side canyon, he saw a landed disc-shaped craft sitting on the ground and three humanoid beings walking around it. The three humanoids were aware of him immediately, and one of them raised an arm high in a gesture of greeting. The pilot became rather unhinged at that point and made a dash for his car. So he ran into his car and raced down the highway trying to get away, and the next thing he knows, this disc comes swooping down and hovers directly in front of his vehicle as though trying to stop him, but after a few minutes, it darted quickly away. He drives to his home in Prescott and calls a friend who is a well-known politician. And uh, after telling his story, the politician asked the pilot if he wanted to report his encounter to the Air Force. The pilot agreed and soon found himself on board a special Air Force jet heading directly to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And upon arrival, he was placed inside a room for a half an hour until finally an Air Force officer arrived and told him that no questions would be asked of him, and without any other delay, the pilot was flown back to Prescott in another Air Force jet. So as you can see, I mean, this just shows how um, deeply interested our military was in this subject. So many other cases, uh, and some involve photographs, many. For example, in the fall of 1988, four tourists were hiking on Bell Rock when they saw three disc-shaped objects hovering in formation overhead. They allegedly took photos of these objects, which quickly darted west to the Apache Mountains. One year later, spring of 1989, two visitors were in a hotel in Sedona and saw a UFO Hovering over Schnebly Hill, this object stopped, ejected a red sphere, which danced around the larger object, and then reattached itself to the original object and darted away. In 1989, uh, same year, a married couple saw this odd egg-shaped cloud hovering over the town of Sedona when suddenly three large green spheres dropped from the cloud and each of these spheres moved off in three separate directions. One Sedona researcher, Dr. Patricia Rochelle Deagle, interviewed a woman by the name of Doriel who was driving home along the back roads of Sedona around 1990 when she says a disc-shaped object flew only a few yards in front of her, right above the road. It turns out her husband was driving behind her in a separate car, and she slowed down, hoping her husband would catch up. But when she slowed down, so did the UFO. She slowed down even further, so did this object, and she approached her home in Oak Creek. And finally, her husband appears behind her, and this object takes off straight up. Uh, she told her husband what had happened. He, he said that he had also seen the object and thought at first it was a shooting star until he saw this thing move straight up and disappear. But what's interesting about this case is according to Dr. Deagle, 
This is not unusual in that she has investigated more than 36 similar cases involving people who have encountered UFOs along the back roads of Sedona. And she says their descriptions of the encounter are very similar to Doriel's, in which these objects come swooping down and follow these cars right over the highway. So yeah, many people have photographed these objects. Another photographic case occurred on August 14, 2003, when a man and his wife were driving through Sedona, taking pictures of the landscape. They saw nothing unusual at the time, but upon downloading their images into their computer, they saw what appeared to be a small bubble type craft. And it was just a few days later when they were talking to construction workers at their home and these construction workers saw the photo and freaked out because it turned out that a few days earlier, apparently at the same time, they had had a flat tire on this same road and observed the same object that the couple had photographed. So as you can see, here's the photo of this object. And again, cases involving landing and humanoids. Uh, sometime in the late 1980s, a woman by the name of Susan Bedell invited her niece, Laura, to stay at her home in Sedona. Laura was sleeping on the couch when she heard banging noises in the kitchen and saw lights and was freaking out when suddenly a glowing light appeared six feet in front of her. It expanded lengthwise and took the form of a small humanoid creature. And according to the witness, this object had a disproportionately large head, gray skin, large slanted almond eyes and a body that seemed too frail to hold it up. So a typical gray. Laura stared at this being for just a few moments. It stared back at her and then slowly vanished. Another case in this one uh, was a landing. Uh, one evening, the date is not given in this case, a retired couple was watching TV in their Sedona home and looking out their window, they saw a blue-white light fall to the ground near their property. They lived in a pretty remote area, and they thought it was a plane that had crashed. So they ran to the site, and instead of finding a crash site, they saw a landed UFO. The object was quite large, disc-shaped, and around it were several small figures with large heads, gathering samples from the surrounding area. Bongo investigated this case, and as he writes, and I quote, The woman uttered some sort of cry, a sound that attracted the attention of the little men. Realizing they had been seen, the couple turned and ran as fast as their legs would carry them. As they struggled over the crest of a low hill, they were hit in the back and knocked down by something that caused searing pain. The couple then lost consciousness. When the couple came to, it was now midday and they were three miles from where they had been the night before. To their further consternation, they discovered they had fresh scars and marks on their body. Another alarming case occurred on May 7, 1993, when a group of about 10 people were hiking in the Schnebli Hill area of Sedona. It was around dusk when they saw two helicopters hovering next to a rock formation. They stopped to watch, as did a small crowd of people, when suddenly the rock face appeared to disappear and become a cave-like opening. And at that instant, several lighted objects shot out of the cave, flew erratically, and were gone. This cave opening then closed up. The helicopters hovered for a few more minutes and then departed. The woman reported her case to New Fork, and as she writes, and I quote, I still don't know exactly what we all saw, but it was definitely something we had never before imagined or could deny. So perhaps there's a base there. There are many rumors of a base in the Superstition Mountains. But yeah, not just sightings and landings. I mean, many cases of humanoids and abductions. Here's another very interesting case involving a humanoid. Uh, this occurred uh, to a lady whose home overlooked Bell Rock. And uh, it was a clear, beautiful day, July 12, 2009. And the witness was in her dining room working at a computer when movement from outside caught her eye. And she looked and got a real shock. 
uh, as she says, I got up and went out to the patio and realized it was a humanoid figure without a power pack of any sort. It flew from the far left of Lee Mountain. She wasn't the only witness. She called another person out to, who was in the house, and they both watched this flying humanoid as it flew in a horizontal path without any sways or dips, they said. They're absolutely sure this was a humanoid, and they kept this experience to themselves because it was so bizarre, but finally one of them reported this case to MUFON. Another case involving an abduction occurred in 1976 to a gentleman by the name of Frank Ramsey, who was visiting a ranch near Loy Butte in Sedona. And he was taking pictures of the sunset when he looked up and saw a UFO, which he described as a bright white sphere about 30 to 40 feet off the ground. So he quickly went to get his camera. At this point, the object blinked out and reappeared some distance away. And then it returned and began blinking and away and disappearing. It moved back and forth. Uh, finally, this was freaking Frank Ramsey out, and he made a run back towards the ranch and was almost there when suddenly he saw this object again. And actually what he saw was a figure standing on the hillside waving a light at him. And he first thought it was someone at the ranch, one of his friends. And he turned his flashlight and moved towards the figure. And at this point he saw that his friends were actually driving up the road to the ranch. And so he turns back to this figure, which was now about 100 feet away. And he could see that this figure was standing next to a bright white sphere. As he watched, a door opened in this sphere. He could see inside, and this figure itself also appeared to glow. And realizing he was seeing a landed UFO and its occupant, he turned to run away, but became paralyzed. Next thing he knows, he had missing time. The object and the figure are gone, and Frank Ramsey found himself standing, still with his camera, in a completely different location. In fact, he was quite far from where he had been, more than a mile and a half away. And it took him almost an hour to make his way back. And meanwhile, while walking back, he started to remember what happened. As he says, and I quote, I have a memory of being inside that sphere. I remember looking out a porthole type window and I remember seeing stars outside of it. Uh, he also remembered what this being looked like uh, and he described it as short, with very large, dark eyes. Another abduction occurred in May of 1981, when a lady by the name of Nancy was in her home in Sedona. She felt a powerful vibration, ran outside and saw this huge object hovering above her house. It was larger than an aircraft carrier, a dull metallic color, and a huge glowing dome on top. And it was one year later that she was camping with her daughter and granddaughter in Fay Canyon in Sedona. They saw a glowing disc hovering. And later that night, they were in their tent when they were visited by a small entity, which grabbed Nancy's arm and took her and the others from the tent. She doesn't remember what happened next, only that the creature was speaking inside her head, telling her that they were rearranging her molecular structure for the purpose of facilitating communication and travel. And here's one final case which took place in Sedona involving a possible UFO crash. A couple were in Sedona when the wife noticed a very bright star-like light in the northwest sky, but it was too bright to be a star, and suddenly this beam of light struck this object from the east. And as they watched, this object flared up and exploded and uh, began to float down. And two hours later, they had friends in West Sedona who called them to say that there was a fire burning west of Highway 89A in an area known as Secret Canyon. The next day, they went to the local coffee house and heard people talking about this fire. And one couple said that an hour before this fire was reported, they saw what was apparently this same object, a small flaming object, fall into Secret Canyon. 
and they believed this was the cause of the fire. And this is when other witnesses began to s talk and rumors were swirling around town because this fire was in a pretty remote area and the fire department decided that they were not going to fight it but let it burn out and it burned for the next 10 days. The whole canyon was closed off and the firefighters only fought this fire when it be started to come close to resorts in Oak Creek Canyon. Uh, but Secret Canyon, according to these witnesses, was closed for three months, during which other residents in the area said they saw military trucks driving in and out of the area. And the witness also heard reports of hikers, including two police officers who were exploring the area but were turned back by military men in black uniforms and M16 rifles. So was this a UFO crash retrieval? Hard to say. It wasn't officially investigated, but it just fits in with the huge amount of activity that's going on in Sedona. Uh, Sedona is definitely Arizona's biggest UFO hotspot and perhaps one of the biggest hotspots in the United States or even the world. There are more than three different organizations, companies that offer UFO tours and a huge number of photographic cases, as I mentioned. This is a very active area and has had a huge influence on our understanding of UFOs. And that's why I gave it case slot number four on this list. And now we get to the top three. And if you know anything about UFOs, you can probably predict what the top three are going to be. But for top three, for space number three, I chose UFO crash at Paradise Valley, also known as the Kingman UFO crash. There are only a handful of really credible UFO crash retrieval accounts, and this one that happened in Paradise Valley is definitely one of them, and absolutely Arizona's most famous UFO crash. So that's why I gave it number three on this list. And that's uh, really a fascinating case, as we shall see. Frank Scully's explosive book, Behind the Flying Saucers, was not only the first UFO book published, but it was the first to talk about crashed UFOs and the first to mention the Paradise Valley crash in Arizona. According to Scully's sources, they told him that they were actually in the Phoenix area when this crash occurred, and as Paradise Valley was just north of Phoenix, they arrived at the site shortly after it occurred. And on the scene, they found a smallish craft, which they said was about 36 feet in diameter. And there were two deceased extraterrestrials. As Scully writes, and I quote, one of the little men was half out of the escape door or hatch, as the doctor called it. The little man was dead. The other little fellow, there being only a crew of two on the ship, was sitting in his seat at the control board. He was also dead. So that was the first leak in this case. And the next leak came from researcher Richard Hall way back in 1964. And Richard Hall spoke with a gentleman who was soon to be a commander in Vietnam, so a good witness. And this gentleman told Richard Hall that back in 1953, a UFO crashed in Arizona and according to him, there were four bodies recovered, and the craft was described as about 30 feet in diameter and undamaged. And as Richard Hall says, I could not imagine a less likely hoaxer. The third big break in the case came from highly respected researcher Raymond Fowler, best known for his research into Betty Andreessen, and he spoke with a first-hand witness. Uh, this witness initially used the pseudonym Fritz Werner and signed an affidavit uh, attesting to the truth of his testimony. We now know that this man's true name was Arthur G. Stansel, who was an engineer manager at the Air Material Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Uh, Arthur Stansel worked directly with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Eric Henry Wang, who we know was the head of the Department of Special Studies at Wright-Patterson. 
And one day, Dr. Wang approached Arthur Stansel and said that a UFO had crashed nearby in Arizona. As it turns out, Arthur was in Arizona at the time. So Arthur Stansel was ordered to go to this UFO crash site with a group of about 40 other scientists to assist in the recovery of this object. Uh, Arthur Stansel was told by Dr. Wang that this was, in fact, a UFO, and it was Arthur's job to calculate the velocity and trajectory of the disk based on its structure, how deeply it had burrowed into the ground and the whole blast pattern. He was taken to the site on a bus with blacked-out windows and was told to concentrate only on his assigned duties and do not look around. Upon arrival, Arthur Stansel says he saw a 30-foot oval object constructed of an unbrushed metal which resembled brushed aluminum. He said the disc was undamaged and had penetrated only 20 inches into the sand. He said he saw a hatch about three and a half feet high, no apparent landing gear. He made his measurements and studied the area and concluded that the craft had struck the ground at about 1,200 miles per hour. He also concluded that the craft was not human-made. As he says, and I quote, The object was not built by anything, obviously, that we know about on Earth. It was more like a tear-drop-shaped cigar, like a streamlined cigar. I managed to glance inside at one point and saw the dead body of a four-foot human-like creature in a silver metallic suit. The skin on its face was dark brown. Stansel says that all the other scientists were escorted one by one to perform their duties and then were returned to the bus and afterwards an Air Force colonel made them sign an official secrets act uh, making them all swear under oath never to reveal what they had seen. Uh, Arthur Stansel did speak with another scientist who said he was able to look inside the object itself and said he saw two small swivel seats and a strange-looking instrument panel. That was basically it. The next big break in the case come, came from researcher Leonard Stringfield, known for his crash retrieval investigations. And this witness says that he was taken in April or May of 1953 to a desert area to examine the crash of a flying saucer. So the timeline fits, and so do the details, because this witness described the object as 30 feet in diameter. It had no apparent damage. He was not allowed to enter the ship, but he said he did see a hatchway about 4 feet tall and 2 feet wide, and it was his job to analyze the metal. He was at the site for two days, and after his tests concluded that the object was definitely not constructed on Earth. Uh, years later, in 1977, Stringfield was giving a lecture about this crash when someone in the audience approached him, a National Guard employee who said that he was there back in 1953. Uh, actually, he was stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio when a group of crates arrived from a UFO crash that had come from Arizona. So presumably, this was the Paradise Valley Kingman crash. And the crates, he learned, contained three humanoid bodies, four feet tall, large heads, brownish skin, and each was packed in dry ice to preserve it. And one of the bodies, he was told, was female. And he learned that some of the other crates contained debris, which apparently had Sanskrit-like symbols etched into them. The witness refused to make a written statement. He did ask his superiors if he could leave a written statement to be opened upon his death, but his superiors emphatically denied the request. But he still spoke. Uh, and he was another whistleblower who confirms this crash. Uh, here's another very interesting tidbit of information that confirms this crash. It comes from a lady by the name of Judy Wolcott whose husband revealed that he participated in this incident. He was on duty at the air control tower at Kingman when he and other personnel tracked this object on radar. And they watched as it quickly lost altitude, disappeared from their scopes, and moments later there was a huge flash of light in the distance outside the city. 
So he and a group of other men jumped into their jeeps and drove to where this object had impacted the ground. And uh, they were approaching this area when they saw this large object off in the distance, partially embedded in the sandy soil. He couldn't see any bodies at this distance, but he could tell that the object did not appear to be damaged. And they were about to approach it more closely when military officials arrived and ordered them off the site. He was taken back to the base and told that nothing had happened. They had seen nothing, and they were ordered not to speak about it. But there was a lot of rumors uh, that he heard, and that he did hear that there were other witnesses who had seen alien bodies. So he kept this secret, but 10 years after the incident, while serving in Vietnam, he wrote a letter to his wife, Judy, and detailed this incident. And it was one year later he was killed in action in Vietnam. Another possible confirmation of this incident comes from Lyndon Moulton Howe, who said that she met with the infamous Richard Doty of the AFOSI. This was on April 9, 1983 at Kirtland Air Force Base. And she saw a document which actually referenced that there had been a UFO crash in Kingman, Arizona at this time. Another whistleblower is Bill Uhouse, who says that this disc was not a crash so much as it was a landing. Uh, as he says, this ET craft was a controlled craft that the aliens wanted to present to our government. It landed about 15 miles from what used to be an army base, which is now a defunct army base. And according to him, the first soldiers to enter the craft became nauseous and disoriented, and when they exited the craft, they had missing time. They could not remember even going inside the craft. According to U-House, this craft was actually transported to Area 51. He said it made loud humming noises the whole time, which really concerned the military. As he says, the military didn't know what to do. They weren't sure if it was going to explode or what, so they left it sitting out in the open on the tarmac for nine months. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I just provide this testimony for what it's worth. Another controversial and perhaps questionable testimony comes from Len Caston, uh, who says that uh, this craft did occur, but actually contained live aliens who survived it, and they ended up working closely with the U.S. military. And he says that this Paradise Valley UFO became the model to reverse engineer other UFOs and that the ETs allegedly assisted in helping the military scientists to understand and use the craft. I don't know. This is controversial testimony, and I present it for what it's worth. Uh, one final witness is Robert Carr who was a very vocal early uh, whistleblower talking about UFO crash retrievals when really no one else was. He was an expert in nonverbal communication, he was apparently one of the scientists in the know when it came to crashed saucers. And he was very tight-lipped, uh, usually refused to give interviews, but did grant an interview to researcher Gray Barker, and he revealed facts about the Paradise Valley UFO. As Carr says, the other wreck was found that summer in the desert in Arizona by visual observation. This one was burned and it had been out there in the desert for too long. There were organic materials left, but the predators in the heat of the desert had pretty well taken care of the occupants. But they scooped it up and took it along. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of evidence for this case which is why I gave it spot number three. And now we move to case number two. And this was actually a really easy choice. For number two, I chose the UFO abduction of Travis Walton. This is one of the most famous and well-known and credible UFO abduction cases on record. And it's quite well-known, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the parts that have been covered uh, by many other researchers. But I do think I have some interesting and unique uh, stories to tell you which you may not have heard before. So let's just get started.
On November 5, 1975, a group of seven young men, all woodcutters, were working in the Apache Sick Greaves National Forest in the Mongolian Rim area, not far from Snowflake. They had been thinning trees all day and were returning home. And it was around 7.15 when they came upon this glow through the trees. And as they approached, they were shocked to see a cleanly structured craft with glowing panels of light. And Travis Walton, who had the door seat in the front, jumped out and ran under this object. He said it was making a high-pitched sound. And uh, he started, you know, the other people in the truck were freaking out and calling for him to come back. And so Travis Walton was about to return. And at this point, he's standing up, and next thing he knows, he felt a powerful jolt and fell unconscious. And back in the truck, all the other witnesses watched as this blazing beam of light shot out from the bottom of the craft, struck Travis on the chest, and send, sent him flying backwards to the ground. Uh, so this completely freaked them out. They were hysterical and panicking and very afraid. And they screamed at Mike Rogers, who was the crew chief and driving the truck, to get away. Mike wanted to scoop Travis up first, uh, but the men were panicking. They were all afraid, so they drove off and got out of view of this object and pulled over. And they were discussing what had happened and what to do. According to Mike Rogers, uh, he looked up and saw this object, apparently this object, quickly dart away. He shouted out to the other witnesses, but no one else saw it. At this point, they returned to the site. Travis was, of course, missing. They searched the area, called for his name. They could not find him. This was absolutely freaking them out, and they returned to go to the police. Meanwhile, back in the town of Snowflake, residents apparently were reporting some unusual elect electromagnetic disturbances. According to MUFON field investigator Willard D. Nelson, he interviewed a witness who says that at the time of Travis's encounter, her TV failed. As she says, and I quote, I remember it because it made me mad. I was trying to watch the 6 o'clock news and the picture went out for about 20 minutes, right after 6.15. We thought the power had gone off, but we checked that. And a lady in Heber told me that she lost the picture too, but they had a different power company, so it wasn't a power outage. And later, when the Walton story broke in the news, both witnesses realized that their TV disturbances had occurred on the same night, very close to the same time. So meanwhile, back at the abduction uh, site, uh, Mike Rogers and the others could not find Travis, and they drove directly to the police. They told their stories to deputies Ellison and Flake, and to Sheriff Gillespie and under Sheriff Copeland. And the police insisted on returning to the site. Uh, some of the men were too afraid to go, uh, but the police insisted. So Allen, Dallas, Kenneth Peterson, and Mike Rogers returned while Dwayne Smith, Steve Pierce, and John Goulet stayed behind. Back at the site, they searched for Walton, could not find any trace of him. So this case immediately came to the attention of UFO researchers, and William Spalding of Ground Saucer Watch investigated the area, and according to him, magnetic readings at the site were several times higher than normal. Otherwise, he could not find any other evidence. Uh, the police interviewed the men, who were clearly sincere and very emotionally upset. Uh, they wondered if it was a hoax, uh, but they didn't think so, because the men were crying and very upset. And uh, they asked the woodcutters, the witnesses, to take lie detector tests. They all agreed, and each of them easily passed, except for one of them who was too emotionally upset. And according to the gentleman who conducted the polygraph tests, Cy Gilson, they were all telling the truth. As he says, and I quote, I think they did see something they believed was a UFO. I gotta say, they passed the test. 
So the media, of course, heard about this case, and the town of Snowflake was besieged by reporters, UFO organizations, UFO hunters. It was complete mayhem. And while the search for Walton continued, uh, they could not find any sign of him. Uh, they were sure that the men were probably telling the truth because of how sincere and emotional they were. Everyone who interviewed them was very much impressed. As Sheriff Chuck Ellison says, and I quote, one of the men was weeping. If they were lying, they were damn good actors. So while the investigation is going on and the men are beginning to be suspected of committing murder, uh, Travis Walton, last thing he remembered was being struck by this uh, electrical beam. He didn't actually see the beam. He just remembers feeling this jolt and passing out. And he woke up lying on his back and saw lights above him. He was in quite a bit of pain, disoriented, and struggling for consciousness. And as he looked up, he saw figures uh, around him fussing with his clothes. And he remembered seeing this UFO and he thought, oh, I must have gotten hurt and now I'm in a hospital. And he kept trying to wake up and focus and finally his vision cleared and he got a terrible shock. The people he thought were doctors in a hospital were not. They were alien looking figures. There were three of them, five feet tall, with large oversized bald heads and luminous brown eyes the size of quarters, he said. Each wore a featureless jumpsuit. He completely panicked, jumped up, and pushed one of the figures away. He said it had a very marshmallow-like texture, very soft. He looked around and saw this little metal bench with these weird instruments on it. He grabbed what looked like a clear glass-like tube and began swinging at the figures each of whom quickly exited the room. And uh, they went to the left, he saw. So he quickly exited the room and turned in the other direction to the right and walked down this curving metal gray corridor and came upon another small room with a little chair with weird controls in the center. And he walked up to it and to a shock, the walls around the room became transparent there were little controls and screens on the armrests of this chair, so he fiddled with them for a second, and the stars began moving. That freaked him out. So he began searching the room for a doorway when suddenly a figure appeared at the doorway, a male, human-looking figure. He described it as tall, muscular, good-looking, with golden hazel eyes and brown hair, and wearing a tight-fitting blue suit and a transparent helmet. And Walton's first thought that this was a normal human being, and he quickly asked questions. This man completely ignored Travis and instead grabbed him by the arm, led him from the room, down the corridor, into a really small elevator-like room. A door opened, and they walked out, and Travis was shocked to find himself walking out of this craft which had taken him into a hangar in which there were at least two or three other similar craft. And he's like, wow, I'm inside of a mother ship. And uh, this figure led Walton across this hangar to another small room where there were two men and a woman, all of who had the same general appearance. And uh, they laid him out on a table put this mask-like device over his face, and he passed out. Next thing he knows, he's waking up alongside a highway, and this craft is above him and darting away. He recognized the area. He was more than 20 miles from where he had been originally taken. He ran down the highway to where he knew there was a group of three phone booths and called his family. So, meanwhile... On the same exact night of Travis's reappearance, a lady was driving through this area when she saw something amazing. And I'll just quote this witness directly. As she says, I was traveling back from Las Vegas with two friends around midnight, 12 miles from Winslow, heading east. A truck driver ahead was stopped on the highway, and there was this bluish glow everywhere in the desert. 
At that time, I stopped and a huge blue fireball was descending across the highway about one mile ahead of my car. According to this witness, his object moved downward in a very slow, controlled manner and went behind a desert mesa. Everything became dark, though there was no evidence of any crash or explosion. And she's like, wow, was that a UFO? Uh, she left the area, drove on to Albuquerque, only to learn a week later that Travis Walton had reappeared on the very same night of their sighting in the same apparent location. And as she says, and I quote, did I see the ship that dropped him off? So there's possible confirmation there. Meanwhile, Travis's disappearance for five days uh, had sent shockwaves through the community of Snowflake and beyond. And uh, people were wondering if he would ever return. Of course, the woodcutters were being accused of murder, which they denied. And then Travis reappeared, and this caused an explosion, like an atom bomb, of press attention. At first, uh, the Walton family told nobody of Travis's return. Travis was extremely traumatized. He could not believe he had miss been missing for five days. All he remembered was about 15 minutes. Uh, so they rushed him off to the doctor in Tucson to examine him. And according to the doctor, Travis was in good health, though he had lost 10 pounds. They then called the police. Uh, the police uh, conducted investigation, gave Travis a lie detector test, which he agreed to, and he passed. He was examined by a psychiatrist by the name of Gene Rosenbaum. This was one day later. And according to Gene Rosenbaum, and I quote, this young man is not lying. There is no collusion involved, no attempt to hoax. There is no evidence of drugs in this issue. He really believes these things. So at this point, two UFO organizations, APRO and the Ground Saucer Watch, both wanted to investigate. Uh, what Travis Walton chose APRO, and he was interviewed by Dr. James Harder and Jim Lorenzen, who became absolutely convinced of the authenticity of Walton's case. Uh, this case became very well known. Hundreds of articles appeared in newspapers all over the world, some skeptical, others supportive. Some were accurate, but many of them were almost completely fabricated. His phone ran off the hook. It was so bad he actually got rid of his phone. Uh, he had multiple offers for interviews, movie off authors. He started receiving threats, um, all kinds of weird accusations of hoaxes. I mean, the case was just going wild. Uh, the National Enquirer heard about their case, and uh, a report was submitted to them. And they did, in fact, win an award for the best case of the year. They each got a check. And this brought in more accusations of a hoax. Uh, so lots of controversy was still surrounding this case. Within a year of it, a journalist by the name of Bill Barry wrote a book about this encounter called The Ultimate Encounter. And uh, Travis was still getting requests for interviews and seeing how badly his case was being misrepresented and watching other people profit from it, he decided he would write a book. And this was called The Walton Incident, and it later was rewritten into a new book called Fire in the Sky, which was also made into a really good movie. Uh, in fact, the movie was very accurate except for the onboard segment, which was largely fictionalized. At any rate, this case uh, remained a classic. No one has ever been able to prove it was a hoax. Travis Walton said it completely transformed his life, and it wasn't always <laughs> uh, good news. As he says, it will always be there. It changed everything. All in all, I've lost badly from this thing. Uh, people have accused him of a hoax. Uh, Phil Class tried very hard to debunk his case, but no one has been able to provide any solid evidence that this was a hoax. 
And in fact, several of the people, the witnesses, were offered substantial sums of money to say that it was a hoax, and they did not take these offers. Uh, Walton was hypnotized to see if he could recall the missing five days. He could not, and uh, that is where th the case remains. Uh, Walton does not know why he was taken. He hasn't had any encounters since, as he says, So far as I know, I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and too curious for my own good. Recently, there's been more controversy about this case when there was a dispute between Mike Rogers and Travis Walton over money um, involving their story. Uh, Mike Rogers, some people said, detracted his statement and said that this was a hoax. Mike Rogers said that, no, that's not true. He still stands by this case. And in fact, there was a recent award-winning documentary, which is titled Travis, by producer-director Jennifer W. Stein, it's won multiple awards, as I mentioned, and uh, all the witnesses are still standing by this case. They've, they gave very compelling interviews, and this case still remains one of the most famous and influential abductions in history, which is why I gave it the number two spot on this list. And now we get to number one. And number one should be easy to guess. For number one, I chose the Phoenix Lights. This could very well be the most widely viewed UFO encounter of modern times, up since the modern age of UFOs, and uh, is easily one of the most famous UFO sightings in all of human history. It's quite an amazing story. There have been many books and documentaries that present this case. Uh, but I just want to give you a quick rundown of what happened. Um, some interesting and lesser known uh, eyewitness testimony reports. It's just an amazing, amazing event, which is why I gave it the number one spot on this list. March 13, 1997 began normally, like any other day in Phoenix, with no hint that one of the largest viewed UFO events in modern history was about to occur. The first indication of anything strange was when the National UFO Reporting Center, New Fork, began receiving a flurry of calls all across Nevada and Arizona. First call came in at 816 from a police officer in Paulden. This is 60 miles north of Phoenix. He said he saw a cluster of five red lights heading south. Peter Davenport, the head of New Fork, took the call. Two minutes later, a witness from Prescott phoned in his sighting, and immediately after that, calls started coming in one after another. Calls came from all across Arizona, from Wickenburg, from Tempe, from Scottsdale, from other areas, from Chino Valley, Dewey, Cortez Junction, Cave Creek, and by the time this object was moving over Phoenix, the phones at the UFO Reporting Center were ringing off the hook. And thousands of people at this point were witnessing this incredible display. Traffic was stopping on the street. Ball, ball games stopped in mid-play. People were running out of stores and homes to stare at this incredible spectacle. And pretty much all the witnesses agree that this was a very large object. Some felt it was a few miles in length. Others estimated about a half mile. Pretty much all of them agreed it was very low in the sky, a few thousand feet at most. Almost all of them said it was moving very slowly, though a few said it did dart around. And almost nobody heard any sound. A few did report hearing a low Hum. So this object apparently moved directly over Luke Air Force Base, and witnesses who live next to Air Force Base said that they saw several jet fighters being scrambled from the base and being vectored towards this object. And it was so large they looked like tiny little gnats, they said. And according to insiders at Luke Air Force Base, the switchboards were lighting up 
with callers inquiring about this object or objects. And at the same time, police officers or police stations and radio stations across Phoenix were also flooded with calls and the whole city was becoming completely electrified. And I'd like to give you just some direct quotes from various witnesses who saw this. One was a cement truck driver by the name of Bill Grenier, who was hauling a load of cement along Interstate 17 when he saw these objects going towards Phoenix uh, at a pretty low rate, and he actually followed them for two hours. And as he approached Phoenix, he saw F-16 fighter jets taking off from Luke Air Force Base. And as he says, and I quote, it was crazy. I know those pilots saw it. I wish the government would just admit it. It's like having 50,000 people in a stadium watch a football game and then having someone tell us we weren't there. I will never be the same again. Before this, if anybody told me they'd seen a UFO, I would have said, yeah, and I believe in the tooth fairy. So at this point, the witnesses were numbering in the several thousands. So it's going to be impossible to list them all. Uh, the first witnesses started seeing this around 8 p.m. and an anonymous pilot said he saw these lights approaching Squaw Peak moving off to the southeast at 8.15 a retired general by the name of Kelly and his wife were in Glendale and they said they saw a V-shaped object with seven lights and they watched it pass over the highway and they said it made no sound. Ten minutes later at 8.25, a psychiatrist and the, his wife and their child were driving along Interstate 10 and they observed this formation of lights about 300 yards across pass right over their car at an altitude they estimated of about 1,500 feet. There was no noise, but each of the witnesses, interestingly, said that they got a telepathic message telling them not to worry about what they were seeing. Five minutes later, Mike Fortson and his wife in Chandler, Arizona, watched this object pass right in front of the full moon. It was in view for about two minutes, he estimates that it, it was at about 1,200 feet of altitude, moving about 35 miles per hour, and he thinks it was about a mile in size. He says it had a dark black surface, which almost looked translucent. As he says, during the whole sighting, we never moved our feet. There was no question in our minds that what we saw was not of this earth. People say, Mike, you know, maybe you saw a B-2 bomber. My response was, we could land all 40 of our B-2 bombers on the wing of this craft. Another witness was Booth Gerboth, who said that he saw these lights around 8.30 and was convinced that there were these five amber orbs were, in fact, connected to a triangular-shaped object. And he saw it one hour later. So soon it was becoming clear that there was at least more than one object, possibly several, and that this was a display that would go on over a period of two hours. One Phoenix resident by the name of Mr. Barry told reporters, it was pretty incredible what I saw. I didn't know what it was. I just saw lights in the sky in the shape of a big V, and I ran in and got my binoculars. It did not look like an aircraft. It was moving pretty slow. It was big. Another witness was 11-year-old Boy Scout Tim McDonald, who watched this object for three minutes and told reporters, it looked like a stealth bomber. It was in a triangle, and it had three lights. It was there for two or three minutes. When it disappeared, I thought it was a UFO. Another group of witnesses was Don and Grace of Phoenix, and they said this object was definitely solid and V-shaped with seven lights and constructed of what they thought were gray panels, and to their amazement, as they watched, one of these lights detached from the structure itself, flew to the right, and then returned and reattached itself to this object. Another witness, Seth Adams, says, and I quote, It was one of the biggest things I've ever seen that moved like that. I mean, it was just enormous. I don't know if it was as big as an aircraft carrier. It might have been, because I've never seen an aircraft carrier fly. 
Another witness was Stacy Rhodes. She and her mother saw this huge triangular shaped craft, they said, as it flew over the freeway. They were certain it was metallic and uh, they estimated it was about two miles wide. As Stacy says, the object we saw, if we opened up a newspaper, you could not block out the object that we saw. It was gunmetal black. It wasn't shiny. It wasn't invisible. It was more of a dull, bluish black color. Her daughter Emily saw it, and as Emily says, we both just stayed there and looked at it for a couple of minutes, and it was completely silent. Around 9.30 p.m., a couple in Carefree, Arizona, watched this craft as it lit up and moved overhead. And as the witness says, and I quote, My feelings at the time were only of excitement and not trepidation. The ship was not acting in a threatening manner. If anything, it seemed to have an agenda that it wished to execute as efficiently as possible. But its size, its spectacular shape, seemed to represent a powerful presence. It was hovering near the nuclear power plant. Another witness was Tim Lay, a 54-year-old management consultant. He had just gotten home and was exiting his car when he saw this thing. He ran inside and got his wife, and they both stood outside and watched this object move directly overhead. And as he says, and I quote, It was astonishing and a little frightening. It was so big and so strange. You couldn't actually see the object. All you could see was the outline, as though something was blotting out the stars. The lights, he said, were not normal. As he says, they weren't bulbs. They looked like gas. There was a distortion on the surface. Also, the light didn't spill out or shine. I've never seen a light like that. This was a detail that many other witnesses described. Another witness was Erin Watson. As she says, and I quote, I remember looking. It was coming over the mountain, and it was almost as wide as one of the humps, and it was very low. It was just gliding, and then it stopped, and then the sides retracted a little, and it was gone. Shoo! Her husband also observed it, and his, he says, there was no noise the whole time. Another witness was Damien Turnage. He watched the object pass overhead, and his, he says, it was actually five lights that were a V, one in front and two on each side. It was a perfect triangle. Two more witnesses were Max and Shala Saracen. They were driving along Deer Valley Road when these lights appeared. They pulled over to watch, and as Max says, and I quote, It was very spooky, this gigantic ship blocking out the stars and silently creeping across the sky. I don't know of any aircraft with silent engines. Another witness was Dr. Bradley Evans, a clinical psychiatrist. He was with his wife, Chris, driving along Interstate 10 towards Tempe, Arizona. And they saw these lights and watched them for 20 minutes as they passed overhead at an altitude he estimates of only 1,000 feet. Another witness was Trig Johnston. He's a retired commercial airline pilot. He and his 22-year-old son were outside their home in Scottsdale. And they were actually outside looking at Comet hale -Bopp, as were many of the witnesses. And instead, he could hardly believe his eyes when this huge object approached. And as he says, it was the size of 25 airliners moving at about 100 knots at maybe 5,000 feet. And it didn't make a sound. I've flown 747s across oceans and not seen anything like what I saw that night. I don't expect anybody to take my word for it, this was something you had to see for yourself to believe. He's not the only pilot who saw it. As it turns out, celebrity and actor Kurt Russell was coming into Phoenix at that time, and he saw it too. Uh, he couldn't believe his eyes. Uh, he actually uh, reported it and uh, then forgot about it for some years until he heard about the Phoenix Lights and realized that he was a witness. So a lot of really good witnesses. Um, a few people were actually able to videotape these lights. Among them were Chuck and Carla Radin, who watched the lights pass over their home and pulled out their video camera. And according to them, this video clearly shows unusual lights. 
As Chuck Radin says, the video doesn't do it justice. Another witness was Dana Valentine. She's a laser printer technician, and she observed the lights with her father, who was an engineer from their Phoenix home. And they said this object was maybe about 500 feet above them. As uh, she says, we could see the outline of a mass behind the lights, but you couldn't actually see the mass. It was more like a gray distortion of the night sky, kind of wavy. Around 10 p.m., UFO researchers Tom King and Bill Hamilton were in Gila Bend investigating another case of involving a family who had reported seeing lights three days earlier. And they called and said the UFOs were back. So Tom King and Bill Hamilton drove over there and they actually saw what appears to be the Phoenix Lights and they captured videotape of it. Bill Hamilton counted six orbs of very bright light traveling right in front of the Estrella Mountains. And all of the witnesses were absolutely certain that these objects were not flares. So Luke Air Force Base was definitely aware of this, and they began receiving all kinds of calls from the witnesses. We know this because many of the witnesses who called Luke were told that the Air Force does not handle UFO reports, and they were referred to the National UFO Reporting Center, New Fork. And here's where it gets interesting, because the next day following this major encounter, there was, of course, a lot of media stories on it. And uh, Luke Air Force Base was being asked all kinds of questions. So a Luke Air Force Base public information officer released an official statement saying that they knew nothing about the sightings. They had no radar reports. They had no airplanes in the sky that night. Uh, commercial airports also reported no unusual radar readings. And they said they had received no calls. Well, Peter Davenport heard about this, and he revealed that many of the callers he had received that night had been, to re had been referred to New Fork by Luke Air Force Base, which was in direct contradiction to what Luke Air Force Base was saying. So Luke Air Force Base was lying from the beginning. We know they were aware of it. We know they were scrambling Air Force jets, because there are numerous witnesses who saw this. UFO researcher Tom King called Luca Air Force Base after the event and asked them about this. And uh, he was told that no jets had been launched after 7 p.m., again in direct contradiction to the statements of numerous witnesses. Uh, Strange Universe, the UFO program, did a segment on this, and the producer of Strange Universe, his name is Artie Shamamian, he took the initiative to call Luke Air Force Base directly and was told by a colonel that what the witnesses probably saw was a rogue pilot flying with a light rig designed to fool people. It's a ludicrous debunking explanation. So at first, Luke Air Force Base released this official statement saying there were no jets scrambled, nothing unusual occurred. But later they did admit that they did have jets in the sky that night, but that the jet lights could not account for the alleged sighting. They also denied dropping any flares or having any knowledge of any flares. So there's another contradictory statement. They're changing their story and still not telling the truth. It was about two months after the incident, two full months, that the Air National Guard said that they had sent jets from davis monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, south of Phoenix, to conduct training exercises involving flares. They said the jets dropped the flares over the Barry Goldwater Gunnery Test Range, about 50 miles southwest of Phoenix. And a spokesman for the Air National Guard, Lieutenant Colonel David Tanaka, told report, reporters those flares that were seen could have been our flares. So again, they were trying to debunk <laughs> this whole incident. It's ridiculous. This explanation fails to account for the evidence for several reasons. What people saw did not resemble flares. Secondly, the reports continued before and after the time they were over the nearby test range. 
Third, the lights were not seen over the test range, but over Phoenix itself and outlying areas. And Phoenix is hardly a location to drop flares for a training exercise. So months after the incident, officials re released another statement. They were receiving a barrage of calls. Uh, they revealed that they had, in fact, received a barrage of calls from people about the Phoenix Lights. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Hauser told the USA Today newspaper, and I quote, They're calling us liars. I take great exception to that. I've answered every question. We have nothing to hide. But the fact is, we don't investigate UFOs. So, in my opinion, that's a complete lie. <laughs> they are hiding everything they know about these Phoenix lights. Because they scrambled jets, they received a bunch of calls, uh, they absolutely knew something very unusual was going on. In the Arizona Republic newspaper, Lieutenant Colonel Hose Hauser was quoted as saying, We just know it was not one of our planes. Everybody is telling me that we have UFOs stashed all over the Air Force. I'm not taking issue with what people saw. Lots of things can make lights. Dr. Lynn Kite was actually a witness to these the Phoenix lights. She saw them uh, activity well before the Phoenix lights occurred, and on that night also saw them. She also videotaped. She ended up writing a book about this case. And uh, she spoke with a public information officer at Luke Air Force Base who admitted that the sighting did in fact take place, but that they had nothing to do with it. He told her, and I quote, We don't know anything. That's the bottom line. There was something there, but what it was, that's the question. No one knows. Until someone finds out what they were, God only knows. It definitely wasn't a Luke F. 16. So Dr. Kitai also spoke with a lieutenant colonel at Davis Monthan who told her that their unit had been sending off flares for the entire week before this incident. And as Lynn Kitai says, this meant that the flare explanation doesn't fit because if the Phoenix lights were flares, the calls should have been coming in every day not just on March 13th. So UFO researchers were all over this. Researcher John Greenwald submitted a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act, and uh, requested Luke Air Force Base to release any documents relating to this incident, and Luke Air Force Base promptly replied that they had no response regarding the Phoenix Lights and that it wasn't them. And the story was just snowballing. But nobody was investigating it at all. Nobody within government. In fact, really the only government official at all to investigate this incident was city council member Frances Barwood. And she fell into it by accident. She was on her way to a city council meeting on May 6, and she was stopped on the steps by a television crew who asked to speak with her about the Phoenix Lights. And they told her that they had been turned away by every level of government and that nobody would talk to them or investigate this. And Frances Barwood said that she didn't know anything about these so-called lights, but she would make an inquiry. And uh, she was surprised to hear this and asked the city council manager, Frank Fairbanks, whether there was any investigation into this. And uh, apparently there wasn't. And so she tried to unite the city council to ask Luke Air Force Base for answers, but the council refused. And uh, she continued to press the issue, and this is when the ridicule began. But she didn't give up, uh, because immediately after she made a statement on this, she received a flood of calls from witnesses looking for answers. And as Francis Barwood says, and I quote, there were 37 calls the first day, after that, it climbed into the hundreds. I got calls from doctors, lawyers, celebrities. A little league coach called to say both teams and their families had seen this. Most wanted their names kept out of it, but they wanted answers. Heck, if I'd seen it, I'd want answers too. 
One call that really impressed Francis Barwood came from a man who was throwing a hale bop viewing party at his home, and he told her that he and all 20 of his guests had observed the objects. So this really freaked him her out, and uh, she found herself the center of media attention. She was both ridiculed for her interest in the Phoenix Lights and was conversely sought after for interviews. And she realized she had a very sticky situation on her hands. She called the mayor's offices, and the mayor had no statement. She called Governor Fife Symington. Uh, he did not cooperate. He had no information. She called the office of Senator John McCain, and he also said he knew nothing about it. She told reporters, and I quote, It's like a hot potato. No one wants to touch this. Do we have a bunch of wimps who are afraid to look into this? She began to speculate that the Air Force was actually covering this up. Or, as she says, was it that they knew what it was and they didn't want to say? In another interview, she said, It was about this time that some very peculiar things regarding the lights and the government's reports concerning them became obvious, and that I was cast as a total flake. The reports that bothered me the most and probably solidified my resolve to get to the bottom of this were the contradictory reports offered by the Phoenix Police Department. According to Francis Barwood, a police spokesperson had revealed in a television interview that the police station had been overwhelmed with calls on the night of the event. However, a few days later, an official memo from this same police department said that they received only five calls. As Francis Barwood says, that inconsistency itself was enough to make me believe that something was amiss. In January of 1998, she held a press conference in which she said, and I quote, The issue is not whether or not they were flying saucers. The issue is why the government has refused to tell the American public what exactly these lights were. What is just as frustrating, if not more so, is the fact that the information we do get either keeps changing or contradicts what we were told previously. So despite all this attention, Bar Francis Barwood was eventually voted out of the office of the city council. And as it turned out, uh, as she says, and I quote, the government never interviewed even one witness. All I wanted to do was investigate this and never said anything about extraterrestrials. How could they possibly not know about these craft flying low over major population centers? That's inconceivable, but it's also frightening. And Frances Barwood, she said that she actually talked to many high-level military officials who told her, and I quote, we were afraid to say publicly what they saw because they were told it would be the end of their career. So as a result of all this attention, Frances Barwood decided that she would run for the Arizona Secretary of State and promised to look into the Phoenix Lights. As she says, this is a public safety issue of state and national significance, which should not, in good conscience, be ignored by a responsible candidate. We need to get back to what's really important, like our constitutional rights and our state rights. We have to have someone who's willing to stick her neck out to protect our freedoms. Unfortunately, Francis Barwood was uh, ridiculed and called the UFO candidate. Uh, and uh, all she wanted to do was get to the bottom of what was happening. Uh, when she was a city council person, she said she did receive a call from a gentleman who said he had filmed it and that the footage was outstanding. Uh, he said it came very low over his house and he caught really good, unmistakable footage and he wanted to turn it over to her. And she said that she would send someone from her office to pick it up. However, before that could happen, uh, she spoke again with this witness who was thanked her for sending someone over to pick up the footage. And she said, what are you talking about? I didn't send anybody over. And the gentleman said that, well, two gentlemen 
dressed in suits, said that they were from your office and retrieved the footage and took it away. And she told the gentleman, I don't have any men who work at my office. I only have three women. So apparently these are secret government agents who took this footage, which has never been returned. Francis Barwood wanted to, to interview this gentleman, but he became ill, was rushed to the hospital, and apparently passed away. Or she's not sure because uh, he never returned to his home. The neighbors do not know what happened to him and she was not able to find any other information. So yeah, she ran for office, uh, but did not get elected. Meanwhile, at the office of uh, Governor Fife Symington, calls were coming in nonstop uh, with people and witnesses asking for answers. And uh, at the end of August, more than five months after the incident, Governor Fife Symington held a pref con a press conference during which he promised the media that he would assign a special investigator to look into the incident and investigate what people had seen. But it was only a few days later that Governor Symington called another press conference saying that he had found the culprit. And reporters were absolutely stunned when a person wearing an alien costume walked into the room. Governor Fife Symington said this is who is responsible for the UFO reports. He was making it a complete joke. And boy, were people angry, uh, writes researcher Bill Burns. And I quote, For those people who believed they'd been witness to a real UFO event, and for many others who claimed some sort of contact with alien beings, either through abduction or previous sightings, Governor Symington's news conference was an insult. The news conference, if it had been an attempt to throw cold water on the rumors of a UFO invasion, actually served the opposite purpose. Observers were now more convinced than ever that there was some kind of official cover-up going on. Witnesses were put off by the Air Force's denials, the apparent inability of local governments to come up with an explanation, and now the deliberate attempt to make fun of the event. What was going on? Meanwhile, at Senator McCain's office, uh, there was a lot of pressure to investigate the Phoenix Lights. And after being contacted by Francis Barwood's office, Senator McCain agreed to contact the Air Force to request an investigation of the incidents. But the Air Force declined, saying again that they do not investigate UFO reports. And Senator McCain, like Francis Barwood, found himself stymied. And in a television interview, he said, I don't know any good answers to it except to say, so far, we have found no evidence of black helicopters or alien invasion or anything of that nature. But there has been an inability to explain reports that some have made about the presence of lights. So few other UFO events in history have rocked government like the Phoenix Lights. And there are some reports that even the White House was aware of the events. According to reporters Steve Wilson of the Arizona Republic and researcher Jim Dilatesso, on the night of the Phoenix Lights, the government went on DEFCON 3 alert. And he says that President Clinton actually disappeared from public view for a period of hours. And another weird thing, on that same night, a satellite that was supposed to detect incoming missiles actually malfunctioned. And to cap it off, the magazine Scientific American printed a story which stated that strong bursts of gamma radiation were detected on March 13, the night of the Phoenix Lights. So while the political leaders in Phoenix fumbled to deal with this event, most of the citizens and researchers who looked into this case came away absolutely convinced. One of the best researchers on this case is Dr. Lynn Kitai, and her book, The Phoenix Lights, and researcher Bill Hamilton's book, The Phoenix Lights, mystery are probably the most comprehensive reports 
of this incredible event. This event has, of course, been portrayed in many UFO programs. Probably the best treatment was in the Jonathan Fox documentary, I Know What I Saw. Uh, there was another award-winning documentary called The Phoenix Lights, which did an excellent job covering this case. Peter Davenport of New Fork was, of course, very impressed by the Phoenix Lights incident. He says he's never received as many calls for a single event as that one. And as he says, and I quote, the incident over Arizona was the most dramatic I've seen. What we have here is the real thing. They are here. This case is not closed by any means. In my judgment, the events that took place over Arizona remain the most dramatic UFO sighting report that I am aware of. Researcher Bill Hamilton, who observed the lights, interviewed witnesses, and wrote a book on the case, says, My conclusion right now is that the objects seen on March 13 were unconventional, they were unidentified, and they're from an unknown origin. I do not believe that they are our own advanced technology aircraft of any kind. Many researchers believe that the Phoenix Lights was not an accidental sighting, but was actually showing off to witnesses. One of them is Stephen Greer, who writes, This certainly suggests that the objects indeed wanted to be seen. Uh, one gentleman by the name of Ed Dames, who is well known for being a remote viewer, uh, basically a government spy, <laughs> caused an uproar when he said the Phoenix Lights were actually lasers powered by humans and the whole event was a hoax. Most researchers do not agree with this. And uh, nor do they agree with the flare theory, of course. Uh, but researcher David Rapp, who is a laser specialist for the aerospace industry, absolutely disagreed with Ed Dames and wrote a scathing article for the MUFON Journal in which he explained all the reasons why this laser theory is untenable for multiple reasons. And again, there were videotapes and photographs taken. Some of these were apparently flares. Uh, Bruce McAfee did study some of these uh, videotapes and said that, yeah, th some of these were, in fact, flares. Uh, he also believes that many witnesses believe that Air Force officials were aware of the Phoenix Lights and dropped the flares on purpose to confuse the issue and provide a scapegoat. But other films appear to show the real thing. Photographic analyst Jim Dilatesso received multiple amateur videotapes taken on that night, and he was able to determine that there were at least four separate flights over the city lasting for a period of about two hours. And he says these videotapes show that the lights were uniform, they did not vary in intensity or brightness, and he is unable to match them with any known aircraft. In January of 1999, Peter Gersten of the UFO group Citizens Against UFO Secrecy filed a suit against the DOD, the Department of Defense, claiming that the government failed to respond adequ adequately to his FOIA request asking, asking for documents related to the Phoenix Lights. A 30-minute hearing was held and uh, Gersten held up the forms he had received from the Department of Defense, which stated documents found. But he never got the documents, and now the Department of Defense reversed its position completely, changed their story, and returned a form to Peter Gersten saying, documents not found. Then, in March of 2000, Judge Stephen McNamee ruled in favor of the Department of Defense, and in his decision he stated that this case is not one over the existence or non-existence of UFOs, but whether the government has conducted a reasonable search regarding information on specific aerial modes of transportation. Long story sh short, uh, he sided in favor with the defense, the DOD, and no documents were released. And this is when the real shocker came. It was years after the incident when Governor Fife Symington, who had since retired and was now a pastry chef, 
revealed that he not only believed the Phoenix Lights were real, he was a personal eyewitness. And he released a long statement, as he says, and I quote, In 1997, during my second term as governor of Arizona, I saw something that defied logic and challenged my reality. I witnessed a massive delta-shaped craft silently navigate over Squaw Peak, a mountain range in Phoenix, Arizona. It was truly breathtaking. I was absolutely stunned because I was turning to the west looking for the distant Phoenix lights, and to my astonishment, this uh, apparition appeared. This dramatically large, very distinctive leading edge with some enormous lights was traveling through the Arizona sky. As a pilot and former Air Force officer, I can definitively say that this craft did not resemble any man-made object I'd ever seen, and it was certainly not high-altitude flares, because flares don't fly in formation. This incident was witnessed by hundreds if not thousands of people in Arizona, and my office was besieged with phone calls from very concerned Arizonians. The growing hysteria intensified when the story broke nationally. I decided to lighten the mood of the state by calling a press conference where my chief of staff arrived in an alien costume. We managed to lessen the sense of panic, but at the same time upset many of my constituents. I would now, now like to set the record straight. I never meant to ridicule anyone. My office did make inquiries as to the origins of the craft, but to this day they remain unanswered, and eventually the Air Force claimed responsibility, saying that they dropped flares. This is indicative of the attitude from official channels. We get explanations that fly in the face of facts. Explanations like weather balloons, swamp gas, and military flares. I was never happy with the Air Force's silly explanation. There might very well have been military flares in the sky that evening, but what I and hundreds of others saw had nothing to do with that. I now know that I am not alone. There are many high-ranking military, aviation, and government officials who share my concern. While on active duty, they have either witnessed a UFO incident or have conducted an official investigation into UFO cases relevant to aviation safety and national security. By speaking out with me, these people are putting their reputations on the line. They have fought in wars, guarded top-secret weapons arsenals, and protected our nation's skies. We want the government to stop putting out stories that perpetuate the myth that all UFOs can be explained away in down-to-earth conventional terms. Investigations need to be reopened. Documents need to be unsealed. And the idea of an open dialogue can no longer be shunned. Incidents like these are not going away. About a year ago, Chicago's O'Hare International Airport experienced a UFO event that made national and international headlines. What I saw in the Arizona sky goes beyond conventional explanations. When it comes to events of this nature that are still completely unsolved, we deserve more openness in government, especially our own. I could not agree more, and kudos to Fife Symington for finally coming clean. So that's the Phoenix Lights. This is perhaps the most famous and widely viewed single UFO event since the modern age of UFOs began in 1947, and that's why I think it definitely deserves the number one spot. So there you go. That is the top 20 countdown of best cases. And again, it was really hard to come up with this list. There were some cases I just really wanted to include, but there wasn't room. I mean, there's, of course, cases involving repeated visits at the Yuma Drive-In. Really would have liked to talk about those or perhaps the incredible events that are going on at the Stardust Ranch in Rainbow Valley. There's a whole book about that case. Uh, UFO sightings at Marana Air Force Base, a uh, possible existence of an underground base in the Superstition Mountains. I mean, there were a lot of uh, cases that there just, just didn't make the cut. Uh, so it was, again, yeah, really hard to <laughs> include <laughs> 
all of these cases on a top 20 list. I did cover um, all these cases and more in my book, UFOs Over Arizona, A True History of UFO Encounters, of Extraterrestrial Encounters in the Grand Canyon State, which goes into quite a bit more detail on these top 20 cases and, of course, hundreds of others. Uh, Arizona, for whatever reason, is a major producer of UFO reports, and it has really shaped our understanding of the UFO phenomena. I mean, with the Phoenix Lights being the most famous case perhaps in history, the Travis Walton case is one of the most famous abduction events of all times, the Paradise Valley crash is absolutely one of the best verified UFO crash retrieval cases. So as you can see, Arizona has played a powerful role in our understanding of the UFO phenomena. That's why I wanted to do this episode presenting the top 20 cases. I hope you've enjoyed it. I really appreciate you watching. Thank you very much. And that's it for now. So until next time, keep asking questions, keep searching for the truth, and most importantly, keep having fun.